All right, good to see everybody here tonight. Right. Uh, Richard, would you be willing to lead us in an opening prayer? Muted. I, I'm muted. Okay, very good. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blessings that you've given us this day. We're thankful for Jesus who died that we might have forgiveness of sins. Father, help us to uh, concentrate on the things that Clay will be presenting to us. Help us be better Christians. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <laughs> oh, the technology, right? Right. I keep muting. <laughs> and then, then, yeah, then unmuting takes place. So, all right. Good to see you all here tonight. Good to see all of you online. Thank you, Richard, for that prayer. Um, the, uh, uh, tonight, I do want to start um, by, and for the recording, letting people know that might watch this five years from now. These are the two books that we're using that created the outline for us, uh, Onward, and then the other one, The Post-Quarantine Church. And then tonight, we are looking at Mission uh, from Russell Moore's book. And before we um, uh, go into the lesson, several um, I noted in class, I appreciated Adam Rush's prayer and then Dan Arnold's prayer tonight, same thing. I think we're all pretty excited that we have these opportunities to get on Wednesday night to come together. And Adam had mentioned last week the fact that that this time is a, is a time of peace, a time of being able to break away from the world, kind of a respite, um, a, an opportunity uh, for all of us, which is you know just an amazing opportunity. And then I got a few responses about all that and how awesome it was. And Adam had mentioned that it used to be called uh, 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 the, not the, it didn't, wasn't called, oh, it was called prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, uh, traditionally. And so then had some other responses and my mom mentioned uh, the song, Sweet Hour of Prayer. So let's, let's start with that tonight in the class and, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll move on. For those of you online, if you couldn't hear, but uh, just the fact that people, met more people in their neighborhoods. I think that's true for all of us. We've, we've gotten to know the people across the street from us uh, better during this time. And Jennifer's in, in my lives, and, and he, he, he never had to stop working, the, the, the husband of, of the family across the street. So our lives weren't you know, shaken up a whole lot, and he can't do his work from his house, and Jennifer and I can't do ours from our house. So, you know, so our lives weren't you know, super changed as far as that goes, but I feel like I do know more people, or at least have been touched and the relationships enhanced. A really good friend of ours, and I, I think we sent a prayer request out to the church, it's been months ago now, but his, uh, his wife had a heart attack and died, and uh, it was during the pandemic, and he couldn't go in the hospital. He had to sit in the parking lot out there at Riverside, just because of all their rules at the time. And, um, and so, you know, we, that cause, we already had a decent relationship, but even a better one now, I would say. Um, with uh, with that guy. Um, so there have been things that have uh, taken place like that, Ramona. I think that's great. And now it's easier, you know, at least in your specific case, it's, it's going to be easier for you now to say, hey, we're doing an ice cream social or hey, we're doing the chili supper, you know, you know, would you like to come and, and eat with us, eat with our church family? So anyway, that's, that's really neat. And that's a good point. Uh, the, and part of... Um, the um, post-quarantine church book, as opposed to the Onward book, which, as you know, was written years before, but in the post-quarantine book, the, um, th that comes up several times that we need to get back to the neighborhood idea. Now, obviously, we, we drive from all over the place to get here, but we can reach out now probably more effectively in our own neighborhoods, all of our different neighborhoods, and then maybe even right around the church building. People are just more used to being in their homes now. And, and dealing with things from the house, they might be more comfortable. Hey, let's just, let's check out the church that's right around the corner. So any, any other thoughts? Okay, uh, very good. And thank you uh, for that, Ramona. The, um, and I'm not gonna read all 18 verses here, but this, this slides in, this was our concluding uh, section from last week about um, uh, the digital world and really just the idea of God has always been about communication. 
God has always been about revelation. And we're going to talk about reveal, the, his revealed will a little bit tonight. Uh, but that's even the name given to Jesus in John chapter 1, the word. And the, the idea there uh, with word in John chapter 1 is the idea of communication or revelation. It's the, it's the outpouring of, of God letting us know things, uh, reveal. And of course, that was perfect in Christ. So we have the, the perfect written word now. Of course, they didn't have that when Christ was there. It was still being put together. They had, obviously, most of the Old Testament. But then, not only the written word, but the living word, Jesus Christ, this living communication, the, the perfect representation of the Father in Jesus Christ. And so we, we learn from him. We're going to look at verses 5 and 11 of this later. So just, I'll, I'll read the first five verses and then read verse 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So whether we are communicating face-to-face, -face, or in a setting like this, or at an ice cream social, no matter how we're communicating, or as last week's lesson was about, through the digital world, the ultimate communication is exactly the same as it always has been. It's the communication about God and his communication, which was perfected in Christ. And so we never want to lose sight of that, and I don't think any of us would. So if we're emailing someone, it's still about Jesus Christ. If we're on the phone with someone, it's still about Jesus Christ. If we're walking around our neighborhood and inviting them to something, it's still all about uh, Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we know that the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. He dwelt among us. We've seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Just absolutely incredible. Sorry I didn't uh, advance the uh, online slides there. Okay. Sorry about those extra slides. They didn't get deleted. Uh, from, I'm really glad this slide's here. <laughs> I mean, I've got, I've got my, uh, I've got, uh, I've got stuff on paper. It would have been okay, but yeah, this is better. I believe in people being able to see and hear. So, okay. So tonight, three big R words, um, and the first is revealing, and we've just talked about that a little bit. The ultimate revelation from God is in Jesus Christ, but God, for all time, ever since He created, has been a revealer of Himself. I, I like it, Greg, when you mentioned to us and remind us that we have a religion, Christianity as opposed to all or most of the others, um, Christianity has a God who has revealed himself to us, a God who has reached out to us, a God who has been proactive in wanting people to be reconciled to him, in wanting people to come back to him. In the other ones, it's people doing funny little things, incantations, or whatever it might be, or doing things to get God's attention and maybe change him. Whereas God has reached out to us, and we want to conform ourselves to his will. It's just a total flip-flop when you have a pagan religion, when you have something that's come from man, as opposed to something that's come from God. And so revealing is the first one. We need to realize that God has revealed to us, and then we, as we reach out, as we are involved in our mission, we reveal what God has revealed to us to others. The second big R word is repentance. And I really liked uh, how Moore uh, really got this part the, the way we would be comfortable with how he got it. Not just a turning from sin and not just a confession of sin, but a turning to God. And we have two discussion questions that I don't know if we'll get to them, but about how the mission, how what we are about, how can that help us to resist the things we have turned from, and how can it help us be more in tune with the things that we have turned to? And so I really think that's awesome. Repentance in Scripture is the turning away. If, if this wall is evil and Satan and sin and the world and ourselves, we turn from that, but we're turning towards something. We're turning to God and good and salvation and Jesus. And so this turning 
is by definition an ongoing thing in our lives. We are going to have to continue to repent throughout our days until the next life. We do also repent of specific sins. God wants us to repent of those things. He wants us to, you know, be have a godly sorrow for those things. He wants us to do that. But the broad definition of repentance is this, this constant turning. Um, you'll see a lot of passages in the Old Testament that actually use the word turn. And it is the word repentance. And old and new, when you see that, the Hebrew and the Greek, it's uh, from the word turn. And then the third big one, literally, <laughs> pretty long, reconciliation, the third big R word for tonight. And this is important for us to understand uh, what this is about. And I, I think we all do, but the, the idea of being brought back together with someone. Uh, our worldly, or in our worldly, gives it a wrong impression perhaps, but in our culture today and for quite a while, uh, if, if a couple has split up, let's say they separate for a month or two, um, if they get back together, you know, if it's, if it's a Hollywood couple, the news would actually use the word. Uh, uh, person A and person B have been reconciled. They have reconciled their differences and they are back together again. And this is really a, a good picture of what happens between us and God. We have created a problem by our sins. And God through Christ has made it possible for us to be reconciled, to be brought back together uh, with him. And one of the main passages in the Moore book, at least, is 2 Corinthians 5, that we are now involved in a ministry of reconciliation. Part of our mission is this idea of reconciling, or helping people realize they need to be reconciled uh, to Jesus Christ. So those are the three big ones. Uh, before we look at them specifically, let's... Um, take a look at a few mission passages, and then I'll, I'll get some comments from you all if you have any up to this point. Um, obviously, we think of Matthew 28, 18 to 20. I appreciate it. I always get, since I, since I edit and, uh, and then post on YouTube, the ladies' class on Tuesday nights, I get to hear little bits. And, um, and, and last night, and always, always the beginning and end, pretty much, and uh, Lynn Moore uh, was teaching last night, and she did a great job talking about Jesus having authority. And the lessons were from Luke 8 uh, for last night's lesson. And, um, and so it showed the vastness of Christ's authority in that chapter. Take a look at Luke 8 tonight if you want. Ladies, you already have, or at least some of you. So anyway, Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So God had a mission. God had a mission ever since the fall. God had a mission ever since Adam and Eve messed up. And that mission was to bring people back to him. God has always been that compassionate father. He's always been the one that has wanted people to come back, to come back home. And it started right then. And he knew, even before he created Adam and Eve, I guess I should say it started before the creation of the world. But as soon as sin happened, this whole thing had to happen. And the mission was to save. And so we now embrace that mission. We want, I mean, I hope we do. I think we do. Um, if someone comes up to you and says, do you want so-and-so to be saved? I mean, we would say yes, no matter who, almost no matter who is, no, I'm kidding. We, no matter who is said, we would say, yes, we want that person to be saved. Uh, God has told us uh, the fact that Christ hasn't come yet. It's because he is not willing that any should perish. His patience is so that more people can be saved. So we hopefully embrace that. We all would acknowledge and say yes to that question. But God is always about how is the life being lived. Uh, he's not about lip service, as we know. So we need to continue. Part of our repentance is to become more willing to embrace the mission. Moving from a place of coldness and not really caring to a place of being on fire for the Lord, like Jeremiah, who just couldn't help himself. Uh, the fire within me is so strong, I have to proclaim. And that would be a great place for all of us to be. So we wanna move that way. We want to embrace this mission that Jesus gave, uh, the ones around him at that time, but the one that has been passed on uh, to all. And then in Acts uh, chapter 1, 
just want to uh, look at a few verses here. Um, it says one through eight. Um, he, he is giving these commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he has chosen. He presented himself. Um, and then here, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so we read in Acts how this mission at the beginning uh, was accomplished. It was from Jerusalem to Samaria to the ends of the world. And then uh, uh, the last part here of these verses. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And then Acts proceeds. This is the outline of Acts right here in verse 8. It's exactly what takes place as we uh, read the story. These people were willing, and we look at Acts 2, then the apostles preached, people became, came to Christ, and these people embraced that mission. Now, we talked a few weeks ago about how day by day they came together and therefore, day by day, people were being saved. I think our coming together, I think we actually had people come to Christ during COVID. In fact, we had a, uh, Ron was looking at the numbers. We had kind of a stellar year in 2020 as far as baptisms go. Um, but the more we're together, the more that is going to naturally happen. And so that's what we want. We want to make sure uh, that we are together as much as possible. So let me pause there. And, um, and then we'll look a little bit more at revealing and uh, repentance and reconciliation. But any comments here that anyone wants to make about those passages um, or anything else up to this point? While I pause, I'm going to check the time. All right. Anything? Okay. All right. So let's talk about this revealing a little bit more. Uh, Matthew 22 37 to 39 is one of the revealed ways. That, and these are really, these touch with, all the passages touch with um, or touch on the ideas of repentance and reconciliation and particularly our mission. So how does this revelation help us in our mission? And I, it, it's obvious here um, that we need to be loving others. Um, he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And this is similar to, or the idea here is similar to the, uh, what we mentioned just a moment ago about making something real in our lives. Well, if someone asks you, do you love so-and-so? You're going to say yes. Um, and again, we, that's the appropriate answer. I'm not saying that's a false answer. I'm just saying then we need to make sure that is manifested and what we do. It needs to be real. And our supreme example, of course, is the Father and the Son and the Spirit. Um, God so loved the world that he just sat up in heaven and felt bad for all these sinners who were going to have to be punished. No. He so loved the world that he sent Christ. Jesus, for the joy set before him, went to the cross. He took care of the business that needed to be taken care of. And so the same is true for us. If we really love people, if we really, and love, not emo, I don't mean it emotionally. I mean love the way God loved and acted. And I do think God loves us uh, to whatever, whatever extent God has emotions, which he does. Uh, that's part of our being in his image. He has, he's described as having anger and, and other things like that. So I think it's fair to say, or at least that's how God has helped us to understand him to some extent. But... I'm not talking about emotion here. You don't have to like someone to love them. <laughs> and so if we love people, we're going to want them to be saved. We are going to actually do things to make that happen. And that's, that's tough sometimes, right? I mean, that's just not, sometimes we don't feel like it. Sometimes we're a little tired. Uh, sometimes we're a little um, angry or hungry or hangry. Um, I heard a word for the first time today. I was talking to someone, and instead of hangry, instead of hunger making someone, you know, angry, it was hunger making the person anxious. Uh, so it was anxious. Um, this person felt like he would get anxious. <laughs> so anyway, and I can see that. And he said, you know, if he's hungry, 
then all the little things that normally wouldn't bother him and cause him anxiety or stress start to. And just talking about the importance of, of diet and nutrition and all those kinds of things. So anyway, that was really interesting. So you, know, you can start spreading anxious around if you feel like it. Um, but uh, anyway, so if we love people, though, we are going to make things real uh, in their lives. So any, any thoughts about that? Any? Okay. All right. Talking of crowd tonight. All right. So here's our John passage again. Uh, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness does not overcome it. And then nine, um, uh, the author only put verse 11, uh, but I wanted to include nine and 10 here because I think um, it's important. And we know this passage really well, but the, the light does shine in the darkness. The light, Jesus Christ, the, the light, God Almighty, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it. Um, and then the true light which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. And of course, this is Jesus. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Well, I mean, it does blow the mind, but God has now given us these responsibilities. And of course, not without backing, God is the one doing it through us. We are Christ's ambassadors. But this true light, Jesus, we need to be, be proclaiming that true light. We must, if we're going to fulfill our mission, if we're going to fulfill the mission that God um, has had for all time, and which he has somehow laid into our hands to whatever extent, uh, we must be willing to reflect that light. So, so moving onward, re-energizing the church in the post-quarantine world, reaching out to others, having a mission, reaching out to people digitally or in reality, I'll say, although that's not very, I'm not pretending that the digital world doesn't exist. But no matter what we're doing, we must be willing to let that reflect. It's, it's a matter of lifestyle. We, we need to proclaim with our lips. I mean, we need to actually say Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We need to actually say, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's witness in that. There's power in that. People will be changed by that. We need to actually say the things, but we need to live them too. Um, Greg can quote the whole thing. Uh, I think it's called, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And... Uh, Whenever me or Joshua Landon is up there, he thinks it. Okay. <laughs> I'm just joking. Totally kidding. He says no. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we, not, we must say the words. Don't think that just living your life is good enough. I mean, it's an awesome thing. But we need to proclaim with our lips. I think that's important. I think we got in the stage for some years where it was like, oh, I'm just, I'm preaching by example. And that's great. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we need to do that. But we need to also just tell people who we believe in and what our life is about. You know, it, it's, it's um, again, sorry, Greg. It's, it's like Greg says about, um, about Jesus. Uh, Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so. If we didn't have the truth proclaimed, we would know that there was a man 2,000 years ago that died a terrible death. We'd know that he was a, a Jew and that he was a proclaimer, some kind of prophet. And then we'd be just thinking how awful that he went to death on a cross. That's, we wouldn't know that he loves us. We wouldn't know that there was a possibility of reconciliation. We wouldn't know that he bore sins when that happened, except it's been told to us. So people might see our good lives, but they might see non-Christians living good lives too. Unless we say something, there's not going to be any context. There won't be any real truth involved in that. And, you know, someone might you know, shrug us off. Oh, you believe in Jesus. You're one of those people, you know, but okay. How bad is that? You know, that's not bad. I mean, we want them to believe, I don't mean it that way, but that's not going to kill us. It's worth the risk. It's like relationships, right? I mean, it's like at some point in our lives, we realize, you know, whatever age it might happen to be, we realize, you know what? It's worth putting myself out there. It's worth letting um, if, if you're at a dating age, it's worth letting that girl know how I feel about her. Um, and if she doesn't feel good about me, that's going to hurt. That might be a little bit crushing. But you know what? It's worth it because nothing happens 
no relationship can take place if you don't lay it out there. And the same is true with Christ. And with, 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 with relationships, we learn that at some point, that I just need to be transparent and real and forthcoming. But the same is true with Christ. And so with our mission, let's be willing to reflect that light that we read about uh, right here. Okay. And then our um, uh, kind of our main, maybe our main text, just verse 19 here, but we'll look at the whole thing in a minute. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So this is part of that revealing. This is what God has revealed to us, that, that he wants to bring people back, and we need to be part of that. That's part of our mission. So let's look at repentance. I mean, actually, I will... I'm just, I hate skipping verses, but I knew there was too much for tonight. Um, Sorry about that on you guys on the, there we go. I I was pretty much caught up with you guys. Um, Check out Acts 2 um, this week or tonight and Colossians 3. And then let's get to reconciliation. And I'm going to go down to our main text. We'll just look at that main text as we end tonight. So what I want you to really notice here. Um, is that this is part of our ministry. This is part of our message. This is part of what we're doing. Oh, that was not five minutes. <laughs> oh, it's just now five till. So someone jumped the gun and then someone else rang it at five till. Okay, we're good. Some of those teachers downstairs, I heard two bells and the kids are running wild in just a few minutes. But anyway, okay. So in verses 16 to 21 in this passage, you're going to see the word therefore three times. Therefore, therefore, therefore. And so I want to read the part that's right before the first therefore, at least. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him, who for their sake died and was raised. Again, if it wasn't for the Bible, we would have no clue about this. We would have no idea. It says we have concluded this. Well, it's been concluded because God revealed it. One has died for all. Jesus, what an amazing picture in Revelation. The lamb, was the, the lamb that was slain. And he's alive. And he's there in heaven. And he's being worshipped. But he's the lamb that was slain. One has died for all. And so then, therefore, because of that, just because of that, and what God has revealed to us in its entirety, really, but but because one has died for all, we regard no one according to the flesh. Because we know Jesus died for someone, our neighbor, our classmate, our coworker, because we know Jesus died for that person, we do not regard that person in the same way anymore. We realize that here's a person who needs Jesus Christ. Here's a person who needs to be saved. Here's a person who needs to be enlightened, who needs to see the light, who needs spiritual life. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus so longer, no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And that's all of us. We are new creations. When we come up out of that water, we have been transformed. We have been changed. And so, again, let's make sure we, we live it and speak it. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, brought us back together, um, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He's given us a job to do. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So if if nothing else tonight, realize that our mission, our goal, is the same as God's, and we want people brought back together with God. And this includes the ideas of reconciliation, the bringing back together, the idea of repentance. People need to repent. Um, And the revealing. So it's been revealed to us, we then need to share it uh, with other people. And then this verse ends with the third, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal 
I mean, that's, that's heavy. It's heavy stuff. I'll tell you, it's unbelievable that we have been given these responsibilities. And again, we haven't been giving, we have not been given them empty handed. We have the truth. We have the light. We have the spirit. I mean, we have everything we need for life and godly. We have everything. Um, but it's just amazing that God has chosen this way. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ. So Paul gets a little bit uh, personal there. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It goes full circle from verses 14 and 15. But this is what God did. This is the way of salvation. This is how we are saved, and this is what we need to proclaim to other people. So do you think repentance is a popular message today? Why or why not? I'll touch on that next week. And then here's the turn from and the turn to questions. How does remembering you're a new creation help you battle the tendency to cling to what you've turned from? And how does remembering your new creation help you to fully embrace what you've turned to? So let me do this real quick. Um, next week, reconnect with the community near your church. After that, we'll get back to Moore's book and talk about human dignity. So let's all pray together. God, we thank you for this time that we've had to be together tonight. Help us to realize our mission. Help us to realize how it connects with the digital world, how it connects with our personal lives and our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our schools. Father, help us to really embrace uh, the life of Jesus Christ and help us to have the mind of Christ. Help us to fully embrace the word, the living word, the communication, the revelation that we have through him, and help us to realize that you've given us everything to be successful in this. Help us to be strong. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.